Welcome to the CSE 230 Computer Organization course. My name's Sean. I'm a TA for the lab. I'll be helping to proctor for that. I am currently an undergraduate student, as the rest of you are most likely. And I've developed a bit of vid videos here to help you get used to VHDL, which is a hardware abstraction language that should help you to develop your project as you go through the semester. But before we begin, let's discuss a little bit about what VHDL is and what it can do for you. So, VHDL. What is it and what's it good for? Well, VHDL stands for VHSIC HDL. What on earth is that? It's an acronym within an acronym. And it stands for Very High Speed Integrated Circuit. Circuit for those who can spell. Hardware Description Language. And what does that mean? How is it different from a normal programming language? Well, VHDL looks like a typical programming language, but it's not. It works a little bit differently, and there's some foundational differences between what a traditional programming language can do and what VHDL will do for you. But we'll discuss this more in depth as we go along. For the moment, what you can think about VHDL as is it allows you to design an object solely in uh, a traditional, somewhat programming sense, and then you can compile this onto a chip. And what is that chip? Well, you'll see it in the lab, and it's what this thing in the background is here. This is Cortis 2. And Cortis 2 allows us to compile designs for the Altera family of uh, FPGAs, or Fully Programmable Gate Array chips. And these chips are customizable via software download so that you can demo or model pretty much anything that you want to on them within reason. So for instance, if I have an FPGA chip, I could put a simple stopwatch on it or I could put an MP3 player on it. You know, it all comes down to what I've designed for it and what I can use it for. In your case, you'll be building a processor on it that'll do some simple uh, processes like addition, subtraction, XOR, and whatnot, and so forth. So let's take a look at the Cortis 2 IDE right here. We've got a basic, uh, this is what it'll look like when you come into it. This is actually the uh, student version, version 9.1. It's uh, fully downloadable off of uh, Cortis's website. So let's start a new project. We'll just go to new here. Oh, excuse me. And that wants us to do new files. So we'll go to new project wizard. And this just tells us basic info. We're going to need to know where we want to create it. And I've created a folder there. We'll have to name it something. So we'll call this simple project. And we'll hit next. And then it'll ask us if we want to include any files in the project. We don't have any pre-made files, so we don't have to worry about this. If you have pre-made files later on, this is where you would include them. We'll hit Next. Here's where you can choose which piece of equipment that you want to use this for. So throughout here you see all these different chips that Altera provides. And in fact, there's different types of boards that Altera provides here. Uh, we'll be using a Cyclone 2 and it'll be one of the chips underneath here, but for now we don't need to care about which device we're using. So we're going to take Auto Device selected by the fitter. This allows us just to play around without having to worry about how much memory we have and how much we're going to run out of. So we'll hit Next. We don't need to worry about any of the EDA tools and it'll give us a basic readout of what we've done so far and what it's going to create. We'll just hit finish. Okay, so we've got nothing now. Completely blank. Yay! Okay, so let's start working here. We'll go to File New, and we're going to create a block diagram schematic file. It's here underneath Design Files. It's just in, in this drop-down. And that gives us this right here. And this is basically, think of it as an architect's design for computers or for our FPGA. And this allows us to put down all of our different models that we'll develop, either in VHDL or in schematic capture. Right now we're playing around in schematic capture, which truly, truly allows us just to draw right on it. So let's start some drawings. Over here is our toolbar, and our toolbar allows us to select different items that we'll use within our schematics. So right here we'll scroll down to Symbol Tool, and underneath Libraries, we can see all these different items right here. Mega functions are something that we will use later on, but for now we're not going to care about. We're going to come to others are, is another field that you usually won't have to worry about. But right here is our meat and bones. This is primitives. And underneath here we have all the traditional things that you might want in a design. So for our case, we want some logic. Let's build an AND gate. OK. Select it, and we'll just left click anywhere we want, and we have an AND gate. And sometimes Cortis's IDE is a little bit wonky, as you can see here, this yellow line overlapping this blue. And if that happens, just click on it, or drag it around a little, and it'll clean right up. So an AND gate by itself isn't too terribly interesting. Let's grab something else. Let's grab an OR gate. Right here you can see we have all these different gates that we can choose from. This is binary, not, um, 
another another B OR gate right here. We have a couple NAND gates here, uh, and we want the two OR gate. We're gonna plop that down right there in front of our AND gate. A little bit more. Okay, so now we have two gates, but they're just kind of floating in space there. Is there any way that we can connect them up? Definitely. So right here we come to our orthogonal node tool, which is really just a fancy way of saying wire. So we're going to grab this, draw a wire here, and then we're going to draw a couple more wires floating out in space right here. One here, one here, and another one down here. One more right out here. Okay, so now we have some wires and we have some gates, but we're not really doing anything with them. So let's grab our tool again. Only this time we're going to scroll down to pin. This is what allows you to connect up to the different controls on the VHDL, excuse me, on the chip for Altera, and would also allow you to do simulations within Cordis here. So we're going to grab an input. And if I just click again, I can put another one down and another one. And then we also want to grab an output pin. It's nice to have things that do stuff, right? That's exactly what the output's for. So now we're just going to connect them up. Make sure it turns into a box when you drag it all the way over. Otherwise, most likely, you're not actually making a connection. If you don't make a connection, you'll see a little X where your line is. Having these names here, pin name, pin name 2, pin name 3, isn't exactly very interesting. So let's rename that. We're going to double click here where it says pin name, and we're going to change it. So I will call this A in, because I like to have a convention that lets me know what an input is. B in, we'll call this C in. And this guy over here, I'll just call result. Okay, awesome. So now we've made a block diagram of a very simple function here. All right, let's save it. We'll just call it simple project. And then we're gonna go make it go. So up here in this toolbar along here, you see this little button right here, start compilation. This will go through the full shebang. If you hit this button, it'll compile it, it'll design it for what it needs to do for the board, and you will be able to upload it straight to the board. Uh, that can take a little bit longer. So for our purposes, we don't need to do all that. We're just gonna do the analysis and synthesis, which goes through all the compilation, but none of the necessary fitting and plotting for the chip specific. So we're just gonna click that. You'll start to see over here, uh, there's a percentage bar as it goes through each one of the steps. And hey, I didn't mess up, so that's a step in the right direction. Okay, so now we can see here that the total number of logic elements it used, uh, the functions that it implemented, and the total number of pins. Uh, down here you get a little bit more information that you may want. Sometimes you get info, sometimes you'll get warnings, and then worst of all is obviously the errors. We have none of those because we are all awesome programmers who never make mistakes. Okay, so that's great. So now we have a compiled design, but what can we do with it? Well, we want to simulate that. So we'll come up here to File. We're going to go to New, and we're going to go down to Vector Waveform File. That's underneath Verification and Debugging Files. That's going to be what allows us to see how this function behaves over time. So we're going to say OK, and that gives us something here. Right here underneath Name, if you right-click, you can go to Insert, It'll say node or bus, and we'll go to node finder, and then right up here where it says pins all, that's exactly what we want, and we're going to list them. This lists everything that's on that design. So we're going to say we want A, we want B, we want C, and I'm going to hold down shift. There we go. We want everything. All right, it's going to say multiple items. Uh, we have a, a different radix that we can sort here. So if you have what's uh, called a multi-vector bus. In other words, if you have uh, multiple bits on the same line, it'll give you the option of seeing it in ASCII, in binary, uh, in hexadecimal, octal, signed, unsigned, all that fun stuff. Uh, we really don't really need to worry about what we're doing here, so we'll just leave it in hex. Um, our bus width is one, just means we're one bit wide. We'll say okay. So right here we have this is an, these are all of our inputs, and then our result is an output, and it's all these little hashes right here because we don't have anything going to it. So we need to put some inputs on our different lines here. And we're going to take this and right-click, and go to Insert, or excuse me, we're going to go to Value, and we're going to go to Clock. 
Clock allows you just to turn it from high to low, high to low, high to low. There's all different options in there, including ones that are arbitrary or completely on or completely off that you can play around with. So we're going to make this kind of quick. We're going to say that it's a 5 nanosecond period with a duty cycle of 50%, so it's the square wave. And there we go. We're going to do the same thing for B, clock, except we're going to double him. And we're going to do the same thing for C and double him again. 20. And there we go. Those are going to be the different values that get simulated on this result. So we're going to save this here. It'll ask you for a name. We'll call this simple project waveform. And now we can simulate. So we're going to go to processing and start simulation, or you can go to simulator tool. I prefer the simulator tool. There's two different modes of simulation. One is timing and one is functional. Functional just simulates the exact results. So if I have A and B together, it will give you a C, or however we define our function. Timing gate delays. And gate delay is when I turn the power onto something, it takes a little while to push through that device. Now I grant you we're talking electricity here, so this isn't very fast, or excuse me, very slow. This happens on the order of nanoseconds. But for our simulations, nanoseconds matter, and you'll see as you work on your project that uh, certain things will start to delay how long it takes to get through your system. So the more components you have in your path, the longer it's going to take. That's what the timing analysis will tell you, and it'll be really instrumental in helping you to discover uh, timing issues that are going on in your circuit. For instance, something's happening on this part of the circuit, but it needs to be to a different part faster, so you can kind of fine-tune that. But for now, we're just going to do functional. We don't care about any of that timing stuff. In order to do functional, you also have to generate this functional simulation netlist. So we'll hit that button. It'll do some magic here while we're waiting. It's successful. And then we can just hit start. Oh, excuse me. You also have to input a file. Now we'll start. Simulator is successful, and we can go down here to report and view. That looks like a mess, so what we can do is grab our little zoom tool over here and we can start zooming in to figure out what is going on. So as we can see here, when A and B are both high, it's true. Or anytime when C is high, it's true. And when they're all false, it's false. So we verified that our function works. That's pretty cool. But for large projects, it's going to be kind of a pain in the butt. You don't want to be sitting there drawing a million AND gates or a million OR gates over and over and over. Even with copy and paste, that gets a little bit tedious. So what can we do to save a little bit of our time and, if we're lucky, a little bit of our sanity? Well, that's where VHDL comes in. So I'm going to close this project, and we're going to open a new one. Actually... I'm going to scratch that. I'm going to reopen that project because we can do it right in here. So let's implement this entire function here as a single VHDL file. It'll save us some time. We're going to go to New. And we're going to go to VHDL file here. That's underneath Design Files once again, just like our block diagram was. And here we go, a blank sheet of paper. Holy God, what do we do with this? <laughs> Well, we're going to start doing what we're used to doing, and that's filling it up with words that make some sort of sense for the computer. <laughs> so we're going to start by saying library. Library is just a standard set of functions. Uh, Cordis comes with a couple of them. The big one is IEEE. This has uh, standard definitions for things like logic vectors for uh, buses and sometimes some math functions as well that you might want to use. And we need to use this library, so we're going to say use IEEE standard logic. 1164, which defines a bunch of different variable types, all, because we want everything. Now we need to create our entity. Well, let's name it. Entity. This is the basic definition for any object in VHDL. So we're going to call ours simple object. And our simple object is an object with a port. What's a port? Well, a port is these guys right here. It's our A, B, and C, and it's going to be our output. It's basically all of the lines going in and going out of a project. So we're going to have an A, a B, and a C. And all of these are going in, and they're going to be standard.